So the game is trivia, and the category is famous Bible stories. And I toss this picture on the screen, and you respond by saying, what is Jonah and the whale? Well, yeah, one of the most famous Bible stories of all time. Even if you've never cracked open the Bible uh, through life's journey, you have heard of the story of Jonah and the whale. Which is very interesting because I'm not sure if you're aware of this, if you ever realized the word whale is never found in the story. Never found. A great fish is mentioned in the story of Jonah. And uh, uh, we assume that it's a whale because it's the largest of the sea creatures. But the story is not about the fish. The fish is not the main attraction because in the four chapters of Jonah, 48 verses, the fish is only mentioned four times. In fact, the story is not even about Jonah himself. Jonah, in his name, is only mentioned 18 times in the little book of Jonah. There is a main character. The name of God is the one who wins the Oscar. Out of the 48 verses, the name of, of God is mentioned 38 times. God is deeply involved in the story of Jonah. In fact, if you take God out of the story of Jonah, there is no story. Now this weekend, we conclude our summer series entitled Storyteller, where we've been uh, searching and looking at some fantastic stories of the Old Testament that speak of the character traits of God, the storyteller. And as God has been revealing himself through history, he wants to continue that. He wants to write his story in our hearts, upon our lives, in your life, and in my life, and the life of our church. Now, in response to our story for today, Jonah and the fish, some will say, did this really happen? Like, Adam, really, I'm a thinking person here. I realize that I don't have advanced degrees in marine life, but I did go to school. And, I mean, really? I mean, a fish swallowed a guy, and he was in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights, and then he was thrown up onto the beach. I mean, come on, I'm an intelligent person. Did that really happen? Or is this like an allegory or a fairy tale or some story? What, what's going on here? Well, I want to pause and I want to make a couple comments here. First, we know that Jonah was a real person. In fact, there are other places in the Old Testament that reference Jonah and who he was and the role that he had fulfilled. God had confirmed Jonah as a prophet, as one of his prophets. I don't have time to turn there, but if you look at 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, it speaks of Jonah as a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel. He served during the time of King Jeroboam II. So Jonah was a real person. We have multiple sources within the Old Testament that speak to this fact. But the most compelling reason that I believe Jonah and the fish is a true story is because Jesus speaks of this experience. Matthew 12, 40 says these words. Jesus says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In other words, what Jesus was talking about in this verse was his own death, burial, and resurrection. He was, uh, he was making a prediction. He was saying that I'm going to go and I'm going to go in the grave for three days and three nights, but I'm coming back. I will be raised from the dead. You think about that claim for a moment. If there is a man who predicts his own death, and this man also predicts that he's going to come back to life, a man named Jesus, the God whom I have trusted and many of you trusted with your entire life, if this Jesus, one who predicts his death and his resurrection, his appearance, in fact, in Corinthians, Paul says that over 500 eyewitnesses had seen the resurrected Christ. He had breakfast with his apostle Peter on the beach. I mean, there was so much evidence that points to this fact. If this Jesus says that Jonah was in the belly of a huge fish for three days and three nights, then I'm thinking, who am I to disagree with Jesus? Are you with me? You know what I mean? If uh, Jesus is resurrected from the dead, then everything that happens in this book is true, and it matters. 
If Jesus doesn't resurrect from the dead, if he doesn't come back to life, then none of this matters. But because Jesus came back to life, which I believe there's enough historical evidence that supports this, then what Jesus says, all of his miracles, every story found in the page, on the pages of Scripture is true and accurate. And Jesus, the Son of God, says that Jonah is a real person. And the miracle and the story of Jonah is true and factual. So with this, with this in mind, let's see how the story begins and play, plays out. If you have a paper copy of the Bible, you want to take those and turn with me to Jonah. Jonah is in the Old Testament, obviously, and it's a small little book. You can go to your table of contents, or if you have a mobile device, you can go there or to our app. And uh, let's look at Jonah chapter 1 together. Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, uh, we read these words, and uh, God speaks to Jonah. God says, uh, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So let me stop there for a moment. God tells Jonah to travel 600 miles east to Nineveh, which is modern day Iraq. Now, here's what Jonah does, verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. Now, you have to see a map to truly appreciate Jonah's travel plans. All right? On this map that's on the screen, just take a look. In the middle, you'll see Italy there, the boot-shaped country. And uh, to the east of that, you'll see two other cities. You'll see uh, Nineveh and you'll see Joppa. Now, between Nineveh and Joppa is the nation of Israel. Remember, Jonah is a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel. And in verse 2, God calls Jonah to go 600 miles to Nineveh. And what does Jonah do? Jonah goes to Joppa, he buys fare, a ticket, and he goes a thousand miles across the Mediterranean to Tarshish. A thousand miles, which is modern day Spain. Now, why does he do this? What, 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 what's going on here? There's a couple questions that we have, to, we have to stop and ask ourselves. First, why Tarshish? What's significant about Tarshish. Well, the first thing that we know from Scripture is that Tarshish is rich with resources, gold and silver, craftsmen, cedar. In fact, uh, King Solomon imported much of its resources from Tarshish, sent large ships there, as well as the craftsmen from Tarshish to help erect and build the temple found, the first temple uh, found in the Old Testament. Very elaborate, very ornate. Much of the product, the goods and the services came from Tarshish. So we know that it was a paradise kind of place. We know that it was uh, very remote and distant, something that is... Uh, a very significant when it comes to the story. If you look on the map, you, you'd quickly realize that uh, the map ends right about Spain because that was the known world of the day of Jonah. Jonah, he boards the, the ship to go to the farthest point that is known to humankind. He goes to Tarshish. Why? Because he's running from God. Have you ever run from God? Have you ever tried to escape his presence and flee from him? Usually when we run from God, it's because one of three reasons. First, we think we know better. We think we have it figured out, and we know better than God. Now, we wouldn't admit this, of course, but when we look at the plans of our lives, the steps of our lives, we think that we walk by sight and not by faith. We know better than God. Or secondly, we run from God because we're selfish, there's rebellion that's locked up in our heart. And when God clearly speaks to us or nudges us or calls us a certain direction, we choose to go in the opposite direction. Or finally, we run from God because we fear the implications of that choice. If I follow God, what does that mean? If I follow him, what do I have to give up? If I follow him, what relationships will I lose? If I follow him, what's the scale of difficulty in obeying the voice of God. Either we think we know better or we're selfish and rebellious 
or we just fear the voice of God and the sacrifice and commitment that those steps might take. And so we choose to run from God. You know, we all have a little Jonah inside of all of us. There's a little Jonah inside all of us. So what happened? Well, before we go there, we have to ask the second question. If it's Tarshish, why not Nineveh? Why not Nineveh? Why, why did Jonah not want to go to Nineveh? Well, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. And during this time, during the 8th century before Christ, there were two rival nations, the Assyrians and the Israelites. And uh, uh, Jonah had a nice career as a prophet, nice long resume. What Jonah said uh, was fulfilled and uh, God was honored. And among his uh, countrymen and women, uh, Jonah was, uh, he had a nice, uh, nice status as a prophet. He was a spokesman for God. And so Jonah was uh, running the risk of going to Nineveh and uh, declaring that the city would be destroyed. Now, the Ninevites, uh, they were ruthless and warlike people. Uh, they were um, uh, warring against the nation of Israel and a very wicked city. And so uh, Jonah didn't want to go there for a couple reasons. First, it'd be a bad career move. Why would I go there? Secondly, uh, what if God relented and pulled back his destruction upon that city? That's not going to go over well. And quite frankly, as the prophet, I don't feel that that's fair because the Ninevites, they're our enemies. They're against my people. They hate the Jews, God's chosen people. And there's absolutely no way that I'm going to go and I'm going to play a hand in perhaps them receiving mercy and compassion. At some level, maybe Jonah probably hated the Ninevites and he was hoping that God would destroy his enemies. It'd be like today asking a survivor of an ISIS attack to, uh, to, to take goods, relief goods, to a, te a terrorist cell group in Syria. Like a, a Holocaust survivor going on a mission to Germany in the 1940s. That's what it'd be like for Jonah to go over to Nineveh. Third question is this. Who is your enemy? Who is your enemy? It's a pretty profound question when you stop and you think about it because uh, Jonah had the enemy of the Ninevites. He didn't want to go there. Who is your enemy? Maybe today you sometimes wish that your boss would get in an accident. Or your ex who is so annoying, he or she is so annoying. And if something disastrous took place in their lives, you'd say, well, they had it coming. Such a pest anyways. See, I was right. They were wrong. Or maybe your neighbor house burnt down and said, well, uh, too bad, so sad. Who's your enemy? Who's your enemy? See, Jonah is a story about how we deal with our enemies. It's a story about, about what happens to us when our enemies inflict pain upon us and God calls us to go and to speak to them. I'm sure that all of us at some point in our lives have harbored some attitudes within our heart where we would seek uh, revenge and destruction versus mercy and compassion. Because there's a little Jonah inside all of us. So Jonah flees, he boards the ship, and he's headed toward Tarshish. And God has to stop him dead in his tracks. He provides a fish and he swallows Jonah. And what does Jonah, what does Jonah do in this moment? It's quite interesting. Let's read what Jonah does. Jonah chapter 2. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said these words. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. And you listened to to my cry. Do you see the irony of what takes place at this point in the story? 
Jonah is so reluctant, he's disobedient and rebellious, and he runs away from the Ninevites in extending God's compassion. And yet when he's at his lowest point in the belly of the fish, what does he cry out for? Compassion. He wants to receive God's mercy. And God could have let Jonah drown. He could have just, just said to the fish, you know what, just go, go deep and never spit up Jonah. But God saved Jonah. He gave him another chance. God is a God of compassion. God is a God of compassion even when we are a people who are not full of compassion toward those around us, especially our enemies. The story of Jonah also tells us that God is not a quitter. God won't quit on you. God won't quit on you. He won't quit on me. God doesn't quit on people. He is in relentless pursuit of people's souls so that they can experience full life and freedom and joy and peace in him. God chose not to quit on Jonah. In fact, he gave Jonah a second chance, a second chance to go to Nineveh. And this time, uh, Jonah obeys God. At least with his actions. Jonah obeys God. He goes to Nineveh. Everything on the outside appears to be right with all of the, the actions, with all of the, 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 the right steps that Jonah takes. Let me explain it to you. Jonah, he does go to Nineveh and he preaches against the city. Listen to the words of his eight-word uh, eight message there in Jonah 3, 4. He says this, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's the message that Jonah takes to, uh, to the Ninevites. Now, generally in the Old Testament, when God sends someone to preach against a nation, that nation is usually destroyed. But now that Jonah... Now that Jonah has experienced the compassion of God in the belly of the fish, now that he understands that, man, this, this God, he is great. But if we cry out, he's a God who listens and extends compassion. He wonders what would happen if his enemies turned toward God. What would happen to the city of Nineveh? Would God have compassion on the Ninevites? Well, chapter 3 tells us what takes place. He goes to Nineveh, he declares this story. And the king of Nineveh, he declares an immediate fast. He tells all his people to make sure you stop eating food. They tear uh, their robes and they cry out to God. They repent. Scripture says that they turn from their wicked ways. And what does God do? God has compassion on the Ninevites. Uh, chapter 3, verse 10 says, When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. Now, this is a great story, isn't it? I mean, this would be the kind of story right now if we took chapter 3. We could close our Bible and we, in effect, could say, wow, man, Jonah learned his lesson he was obedient to God. Yeah, he ran, but he went back to Nineveh. He delivered the message. He saw the compassion of God. God spared 120,000 people in Nineveh, and he wins the day. Close Jonah, have the pastor, have everybody stand for closing prayer, and get out of church early on a beautiful summer Sunday. Sounds great, doesn't it? Not so fast. Not so fast. A moment ago, I told you that Jonah obeyed God with his actions, but now we see his heart. Friends, you can fool people with your actions, but God always sees your heart. You might do everything externally proper. You might have everything together, but if your heart's not right with God, he sees that, he knows that, he understands that. And here in chapter 4, we see the heart of Jonah. It finally is revealed. Even after there is this facade of obedience and agreement with God, there is this deep anger and resentment toward God. And it never ceases to amaze me as individuals. We can have an exterior sense of obedience toward the ways of God, but inside of us there is still anger 
and resentment about the ways of God, specifically what God is calling us to do and to be and to become. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. But to Jonah, this seemed wrong. What seemed wrong? That God would share his compassion with the Ninevites. Even after God was compassionate to Jonah in the belly of the fish, Jonah still felt this was wrong. How many times do you and I, we receive God's mercy and his compassion, and yet we struggle to share that with others around us, especially if they're our enemies, especially if we think we're wrong, they're wrong. And so Jonah became very angry. Verse 2, he prayed to the Lord. This is what he said. Isn't this what I said, Lord, that when I was still at home, that that is, what I tr- that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take my life away from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Today, we would put Jonah on a suicide watch. Here he was. I mean, he was just losing his mind. This is ridiculous. I want to die. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah was angry with God. You know why Jonah was angry with God? He was angry with God for some of the very same reasons that we get angry with God. We get angry with God because when we believe that someone else is unworthy, we get angry with God for for God giving them blessings that we don't think they deserve. When the unrighteous, when those who are enemies receive something from God, we feel like they don't deserve it, and so therefore, we get angry with God. Jonah was angry with God. How could you relent and hold back your destruction upon that city? God, didn't I go there and preach destruction? I was obedient, and yet you were compassionate. Jonah was angry with God because... God took away something from Jonah. He took away his perfect record as a prophet. Sometimes we get angry with God because we think that he's removed something from our lives that should not have been removed. Our health, our money, our job, a loved one, our dreams, our plans, our career path. Sometimes we get angry with God. Jonah was angry with God because he was self-righteous. And all of us have a little Jonah inside of our hearts. So in chapter 4, after Jonah has this exchange with God, he runs out of the city. He goes uh, outside of the city of Nineveh. And uh, God provides this leafy plant. Now stay with me. This is probably, uh, if you're new to the Bible, or if you've just heard the Sunday school lesson of Jonah, uh, we think about the fish and we forget this final chapter. This is where we really learn the heart of the storyteller. So uh, Jonah's outside the city. God provides this leafy plant. At night, he falls asleep under this plant because uh, this plant's going to provide him shade come the next day. Well, God sends a worm to the plant. And the worm kind of eats the inside of the plant. The plant withers. The next morning... There is a scorching sun. A desert wind blows up. Uh, Jonah grows faint, and he gets angry with God, and he wants to die. I mean, he has no shade source. He's out there in the hot, arid uh, climate, and he's angry again. Listen to verse 10. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? God had to take Jonah under that leafy plant to teach him a lesson about his compassion. He was saying to Jonah about his divine compassion. Jonah, look what you are saying. You didn't cause that plant to grow. And yet you're angry 
that it died. And you didn't cause the city of Nineveh to to be formed and to grow into 120,000 people. And yet you want that city to be destroyed. Jonah, you want 120,000 people to be killed. Jonah, 120,000 people who don't know my ways, who don't know my name, who don't know that they can experience life and peace in me. And you want them destroyed. They're ignorant about my requirements and about my righteous ways. They don't know good from evil. 120,000 people. And you're angry about this plant. God is saying to Jonah, Jonah, you would rather have this plant live than the entire city of Nineveh. And the book ends with one last question. A question from God. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? That's how the story ends. We don't hear Jonah's response. We don't know what he says to God. We don't know if he repents of his ways. We don't know if God breaks through that cold and stony heart of Jonah's. We don't know if Jonah really gets deep down inside how compassionate God is. How his compassion flows freely to all human beings. And I believe that the text leaves us hanging and it asks this question of us. What about you? And what about me? What would we do if we were in Jonah's place? What are our priorities? Would we be willing to to sacrifice personal comfort and security in order to help others hear of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Would we carve time out of our busy schedules and our agenda in order to go to those who have not heard of the name of Jesus Christ and share God's heart of compassion with them? Do we truly believe that people matter to God? Are we willing to roll up our sleeves and to extend his grace and his mercy and his compassion? I think it also asks the question of us, who is our enemy? Who is your enemy? Who is my enemy? You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, in Colossians chapter 1, it's interesting He calls all of us at one time, we're enemies with God. And because of God's, his grace, God looked down from holy heaven and he saw this world spinning out of control. He saw all of our sin and all of our sickness and he made the greatest decision ever. Decision to send his son, Jesus Christ. One of the most famous verses in all of the Bible is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever would believe in him would have everlasting life. God sent Jesus while we were enemies with the Father. And while we were enemies with God, Jesus taught us that no greater love does a man have than to lay down his life for his friends? Jesus called us his friends while we were enemies with his father. In a moment, we're going to have the opportunity to come to the Lord's table. I'm going to ask the ushers to prepare themselves. And as we prepare for communion, we're going to hold the elements that represent the forgiveness and the life and the grace that we share together. God's compassion on our lives. And uh, just a few words about communion. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have made a decision to trust God with your life, accept it, Jesus Christ, the table is open to you. You are free. As the ushers come and they begin uh, to prepare themselves to distribute the elements, you are free to eat and to drink with us. If you're a guest this weekend, 
uh, or you're new to the faith, you don't fully understand what communion is all about, then feel free. You, you, don't have to, uh, you don't have to take the elements. You can just pass the tray. And um, as they begin to distribute the elements, the team is going to sing over us as a congregation. They're going to sing a song, a resurrection song, powerful song. Can't wait for you to hear it. But before they begin singing, I just want to ask you a question. For some of you gathered this weekend, maybe you're running from God. Would you stop running? Would you turn to God and follow his ways? As you get your elements, hold on to your elements. And for those of you who are perhaps running from God, when I come back to lead us in taking communion, I want to pray specifically for you. Because I want you to experience the same kind of compassion that many of us in this room, that Jonah himself and 120,000 Ninevites experienced from our great God. So take a moment and listen to this song.